Let us pray. A holy and righteous Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. Now, Lord, now, Lord, as we're about to look at your word, we ask, dear God, that you'll open hearts and minds to hear your word and to respond to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And amen. There is a old story that's supposed to be a joke it's supposed to be a funny story uh, it's not really all that funny because you always seem to want to have to explain the joke but it's one of them jokes that seem to work better in the Jamaican patois but let me tell you the story many years ago in the back bush countryside of Jamaica there was a clinic that didn't have a doctor and a church sent out one of their doctors on a mission trip to help out in the area clinic. Now, they hadn't had a doctor for a long time in the area, so when the doctor came, they decided they're going to treat him good. Maybe he'll decide to stay. So the community got together, and they set him up in a really nice apartment. They even made sure he had a good Jamaican maid to take care of all the washing and cleaning. So all he had to do was relax and do medical work. Wouldn't have to do nothing. One particular evening, when he's just about to eat dinner, he got a call from the clinic, urgent. He had to run off to the clinic. So, but just before he stepped out the door, because his driver was waiting on him, just before he stepped out the door, he said to his Jamaican maid, heat up my dinner. I'll be back soon. Came back three hours later. He says, where's my dinner? The maid said to him, tank your side. The tea is nice. He says, what do you mean? I don't understand. She says, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, sir, for the gift of the meal. It tasted nice. He says, what are you talking about? Then it dawned on the doctor. In Jamaican parlance, the English heat it up means eat it up. <laughs> so she went ahead and enjoyed his dinner and, then, and she was thanking him for it. I wonder how many times a misunderstanding has caused Lord knows what problems in your life. Take, for example, the misunderstanding that many people have between faith and works. You may not know this, but if you took a deep dive into church history, you would be amazed how much confusion this misunderstanding took place over the years. I mean, it's amazing. I mean, over the last 500 years, if you dig up into church history, you, it would blow your mind. The arguments, the back and forth, the conferences, the tensions, the church splits that took place over the understanding of faith and works. We, 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 you don't hear too much of it these days because as the public becomes less and less biblically literate, you don't hear too many church members going back and forth over it, but they're at the Bible college level, oh, they're still going back and forth over it. It has proven to be a very interesting challenge. In fact, one could say, from a church history perspective, that one of the reasons why many of us are not Roman Catholics is because of the same understanding of how faith and works works together. So today, let's take a look at this often challenging topic of faith and works. Now, you got to understand, this topic from a theological perspective, from a biblical student perspective, for someone who really wants to dive deep. This topic is so big and so wide and so vast, there is no way we can finish it today. We're just going to touch briefly on the issue of faith and works. In fact, we're going to look at it from a very practical perspective, because while I can quote all kind of $50 words and theological words about the impact and the, 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 the drama between the tension of the faith and works. The truth is, if you can't do what you learned today, the sermon's not going to be of any use to you. So let's take a look at the faith and works challenge from a very practical perspective. Turn with me, if you will, to James chapter 2. James chapter 2, verses 14 to 26. Today I'll be reading from the New King James Version. You should have no trouble following along. 
James chapter 2, verses 14 to 26. And just a little hint, if you ever find yourself going to Bible college, I'm pretty sure one or all of your professors is going to give you one of the many research papers on faith and works, and uh, you're going to find yourself sweating in the library trying to figure out how do I give the professor all the answers he's expecting. Well, today we're, we're going to look at one key hint that if you ever go to Bible college, that hopefully will save you some of the trouble in the library. James chapter 2, verses 14 to 26. The first verse, first verse says, what does it profit? Oh, that's a heavy word because everybody today want more money. Verse 14, 15, and 16 reads, what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but, not, but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked, and destitute of daily food. And one of you, no, notice the book of James is written to believers. So when it says one of you, we're talking one of you who believe in Jesus. Verse 15, if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food. And one of you says to them, depart in peace. Be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body. What does it profit? Again. Twice now in this chapter. What does it profit? What does it profit? Now, generally speaking, the word profit refers to money. Refers to an increase in money. Do you know that whole more money, more money, more money concept? You know, that's what it is. But from a larger perspective, a profit generally refers to some kind of gain. Some kind of increase that you get after investing some kind of time or effort. That is a profit, for instance. When I invest the time to go and visit my mother, my profit, my gain, my increase is a massive dinner with all the trimmings. And when some of us um, take the time and go and, uh, and, and, and invest their time in a course at college to get a certification for in some area, even though you may have given the college some money as your investment, your profit, your gain, your increase is a new set of skills and a new set of knowledge that will benefit you for years to come. So the question of profit has to do with a gain and increase. So with that in mind, let's take another look at this verse, these verses. Verses 14 to 16 says, or more specifically, 15 and 16. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? So that means if you come across, I mean, some of us encounter this once a month, once a week, once a day, sometimes several times a day. We come across somebody that we can see is in need or somebody in need comes to us and asks us for help. Some of us get exposed to this all day long. Some of us have certain stoplights. Every time you pull up there, there's somebody. Some people only get exposed to it because of where you work and you're behind the scenes. But guaranteed... Just about all of us get exposed at some point with some frequency to people who we can see or who are in need or who come and ask us for help. According to this, the Bible says, if you just say something nice and say them a prayer and walk away and don't offer them any help, who profits? Who profits? Because if you don't actually do something to help them and you are able to do it, I'm not talking about when you're unable, who profits? Let me tell you something. The kingdom of God doesn't profit because you didn't demonstrate the love of Jesus. The person who needed the help didn't profit because they still have the problem. In fact, they may have had a loss because if they knew you were a Christian, they may feel rejected by God because one of Jesus' followers didn't help them. And you certainly don't profit because now God has no reason to bless you. With this in mind, I want to tell you about something that happened at Lowe's. You know, if you go down Broad, make a right turn, keep going up university, sooner or later you're going to see Lowe's. After Home Depot, that one, that Lowe's. Something that happened in the Lowe's parking lot, Sunday gone after church. Now, 
I don't want to make mess up and call the person's name. So I made sure to write it down because it's really easy to say he, she, or them. And we got some real smart people here that will figure out who it is. And most of you know the person. I ain't trying to rat them up. I don't have permission to call the person's name. So I deliberately wrote it this way. Okay? I was there. I saw this happen with my own two eyes. A member of this church, I want to get it right. A member of this church, who I will not name, was approached by a grandfather in the parking lot of Lowe's. A grandfather who communicated his urgent need. A grandfather who communicated his urgent need with tears. You know how bad this economy is. You'd be surprised how many people are just losing their homes, unable to pay their rent. It's just, it's crazy. You would not want to know how many people are living in their cars. But anyway, that's a whole nother story. So this grandfather's in tears. His grandkids are living with him. The family's in serious trouble. He just went through a whole lot of trouble paying up the back rent, but the current month's rent, they fixing to throw him out because he's $140 short. And if he don't pay it because of all the problems with the back rent, they kicking him out. He don't know what he's going to do with his grandkids. So he needs $140 to avoid him and his grandkids being kicked out as they didn't have enough rent money. Before the grandfather approached this church member, who I will not name. No, I, I wasn't pointing and giving a hint. No, they were up north at the time, so. Okay. Before the grandfather approached this church member, anyone could easily see that this grandfather was rejected by others as he approached him in the parking lot. But when the grandfather approached this particular church member, I noticed something different. Our church member didn't turn away from the grandfather or even try to see if this was all a scam. The church member listened carefully to the grandfather's plea. Then the church member simply said, I will help you. You say you need 140, but I will give you $200. But I'll also ask you a question. But no matter what answer you give, I will still give you the $200. Then the church, members, then the church member asked the grandfather to wait. And after returning from the ATM across the street, the church member first gave the grandfather $200 cash. You should have seen the expression of relief on the grandfather's face. Then after giving him the 200, our church member asked the grandfather, do you go to church? The grandfather responded by saying, I am looking for a church to go to. At that point, our church member gave the grandfather one of our church cards, prayed for him, and then walked away without putting any pressure or expectations on the man. Yes. The $200 blessing had no strings attached. And in fact, the grandfather had to call the person back to ask for their name. I won't tell you who the church member is, but I was there. I saw it happen right in front of me. So now I ask you, did our church member obey the scriptures that day? Did our church member put their faith in God's word into action by allowing their faith to be demonstrated through good works. Now who profited from that transaction? Because the profit thing is coming from the scriptures. Now who profited from that transaction? I'll tell you who profited. The kingdom of God profited because the love of Jesus was put on display through the hands of a faithful believer. The grandfather profited for now because of Jesus. He had more than what he needed to help his family in their immediate crisis. And three, our church member will profit in many ways as God pours out blessings on that member because of that member's faithful, biblical obedience to God's word. I won't tell you who the church member is, but for all you know, they're sitting near to you or sitting next to you. So reach over and shake that person's hand beside you and say, good job. Because you never know, you might be shaking the hands of the person. Now, I know this person well enough to know they can't afford to do that all the time. Once in a while, maybe once every two or three months. But they did not refuse. So I ask you. 
when it comes to your time, your talent, and your resource, because there's many ways. Money is just a universal thing. So this is an example. There's so many other ways to help. What are you and I doing with our time and our talents and our resources to make sure that the kingdom of God profits from what we do? Getting back to our text. James chapter 2 verse 17 says, Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, it's dead. The two key, the last two key words in that verse was works and dead. Works and dead. Kind of reminds you of your old used car. It used to work, now it's dead. It used to work, now it's dead. Bringing you back some horrible memories, being stuck in 995. You pay so much to fix it. Now you've done bought the car three times and finally gets to a point where it used to work. Now it's dead. Do you understand what used to work and now it's dead means? I'll tell you what it means. You have found out the hard way that it don't matter how much gas you put in a dead car, it ain't going nowhere. You will find out the hard way that a dead car can't get you around town. A dead car can't get you to work. And a dead car can't take you to the supermarket. What a dead car does is it forces you to make a decision. Because now you got to make a decision. How am I going to get around town? Either it's going to force you to buy another car or it's going to force you to take the bus. But it's going to force you to keep on moving. But this verse isn't talking about dead cars. It's talking about faith. It says, thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, it's dead. We're talking about your faith, so let me personalize it. If you say you have faith in Jesus Christ, and nobody, not even the angels, see any evidence of any works in your life resulting from that faith, is it possible your faith is dead? If you say you have faith in Jesus and that faith has not resulted in any works that has benefited anybody and has brought no profit to the kingdom of God, is it possible that your faith is dead because that old used car stopped moving when it was dead. Can dead faith save you? If you were stuck in a room with a terrorist pointing a gun at your head and there was a dead policeman on the floor, don't matter how many weapons a dead policeman have, can that dead policeman save you from the terrorist? So I ask you again, if there is no evidence that your faith is alive, can dead faith save you? Let's, let's personalize this some more. What would happen if next week because we all know what we're likely to do in different situations because we've done, lived our life long enough so we know what we would do. So let's say next week Sunday after church, you find yourself in the parking lot of Lowe's or maybe Home Depot. And at this particular point in time, you have already paid all your bills for the month. And on top of it, you've already put aside your usual amount in savings. And... You just happen to have $300 of walking around money in your pocket. Some people call this disposable income, meaning you've paid your bills, you put aside your usual amount for savings, and this is just your loose change to do whatever you want with, and you have not made any specific plans for this money. And a grandmother comes up to you with the same situation. Be honest to yourself. Would you be one of those that 
ignore them, brush them off, tell them to get a job, or just pray for them and walk away? Honestly, the, when the angels are watching you, what report would they have to take back to King Jesus? Would they say that your faith was operating and looking just like your old dead used scar? Or would they be able to tell Jesus that your faith was operating like a brand new Jesus SUV going vroom, 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 vroom down the faith highway, making all kind of profit for the kingdom of God? Notice I said, if your bills were paid, and if you already put aside money for savings, I'm not we're not even getting into sacrificial giving. I'm talking about money that has not been allocated yet. Would you let... Or is your faith in Jesus strong enough to inform you what you need to do now to bring glory to the name of Jesus? What would you really do? Now you see, if you know you wouldn't have helped. Okay, see some people, they reach in and they help, they give them a dollar. Can you even buy a hamburger for a dollar? So which means you're not even giving them enough money, you know, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. You're not even obeying that. Because if you were hungry and somebody gave you a dollar, you couldn't even buy a soda with that at any restaurant. So I'm not talking about money you don't have, and I'm not talking about money that you need for your bills. I'm talking about money, because no... Now remember, there's, I'm not trying to set anybody up in here to be a sucker, to let every scam artist bleed you and make you bank, bankrupt. Because you and I know there's some family members and people out there, if they know you, they will bleed you dry. I'm not talking about I'm talking about what you do when God decides to test your faith. And there's many ways to help. It's not just money. Have you ever come across somebody with a broken heart? They just want somebody to shut up, sit down, and listen. Do you have any idea how valuable that is to them? Are you willing to sacrifice your time for the benefit of another, for the glory of the kingdom of God? There are so many ways to help. Getting back to our text. James chapter 2. Verses 18 to 22. Now, before I read this, I just want to point out. When we get to verse 21, if you're not a student of the Bible, and if you haven't spent time reading the Bible, and if you have no knowledge of Genesis chapter 22, where God really put Abraham to the test, you might hit verse 21 and come up with all kind of judgment. What is God doing? Oh, God is wicked. Abraham is wicked. This Bible, I can't trust it. Sometimes you got a whole judgment till you know the whole story. So I'm just telling you, when we hit verse 21, if you're one of those people who rush to judgment, please go home and read Genesis 22 before you rush to judgment because sometimes a summary of a story, don't give it justice. James chapter 2, verses 18 to 20. 24 says, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe, you believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Verse 22. Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Like I was pointing out earlier, if you find yourself a Bible college, they are going to give you a paper on faith and works. And if you haven't been spending all kind of time in the Bible doing research, you're going to find that paper having you sweating in the library. I don't care if the library is 70 degrees, you're going to be sweating trying to finish that paper. But let me give you the cheat code which many students like me completely overlooked it is staring right in the face and you can wind up going all around the Bible to come back to the very same conclusion that is right here. 
This verse that I'm going to point out to you can pretty much answer any question you have, or at least it's the key to answer any question you have about the clash between faith and works that we sometimes think is in the Bible. Verse 22 is the key. It says, do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works, faith was made perfect? If you think back to the incident I told you about in the parking lot of Lowe's, I know this church member. This church member can't afford to do it all the time. And there's some church members that don't willingly let go of money like that, especially to the people they don't know. But I ask you, here is an example from within our own church where someone allowed the faith that they had in Jesus to have the kind of effect on them that their faith triggered works that made a difference. Their faith was working together with their works and it produced a difference that was profitable to the kingdom of God, to the person who needed the help, and to the individual who made the decision. You see, faith and works, in the grand scheme of things, if you visit enough churches, you'll find that some churches and some Christians heavily emphasize faith. You'll also find another group of Christians and another group of churches that heavily emphasize works. And while the Bible does talk a lot about faith and a lot about works, the truth is God meant for faith and works to work together like a team. Just as we find here in verse 22. The most God-honoring way to work with faith and works is just as it says in verse 22. They work as a team. This is the best way to honor God. You see, faith and works is like paint and a paintbrush. You need both of them for your house to look beautiful and fresh and wonderful. And the truth is, if you do it right, the house will look beautiful for years to come. So if you have a healthy balance between your faith and your works, the results will be amazing. You see, there's something about faith. Faith can get you to say hallelujah. Faith can get you to come to church in person or sit down on your couch and watch church online. Faith can get you to listen to praise music all the way to work, home, and every day of the week. Works, on the other hand, can have you out there in the world making a difference. And now that it is close to election time, you've probably noticed some politicians who you've never seen before out doing works. Doing good works. The question is, are they doing the good works for Jesus or are they doing the good works hoping to get votes from you. See, works by themselves, you can do good works for anybody, but you combine faith and works. Now you're on Team Jesus. Doing good works to honor your Lord. The reason, faith-informed works. It's like faith is the manager and works is, is, is the layman doing the job. Faith informs work. Faith tells work what to do, when to do it, and how to do it and why you're doing it. And when faith and works working together, now you're on Team Jesus out there glorifying God and making a difference in the world, earning a profit for the kingdom of God, for the people you are blessing, and for yourself because God is going to bless you for doing the works of God. But far too many of us are really interested in that selfish, comfortable, me only, bless me Lord, Christianity. You know the thing about it? There's some versions of Christianity that, when you look at it, it's like they're a sports fan. There are sports fans who will sit on their couch and get so fat, I will look skinny by comparison. And they will know every move, every technique, every slot. They know the names of everybody and all the stats, but they can't play a lick. Every once in a while you see a joke on TV, that sports fan is making up a noise. I could have done a better job. And they give them and say, okay, you go and do it. And they can't do nothing. So that sports fan is watching sports all day long, watching people, who look, even looking at the previews at the gym, how they're working out and preparing for the game. But they're sitting on the couch getting fatter and fatter and lazier. They know everything about it, but they ain't never kicked the football. They ain't never threw a basketball. How do you grow your faith? You need to get out of the comfort zone of easy Christianity, the me only, selfish, serve me Christianity. And you need to actually get out there and start playing the game of faith and putting your faith into action so you can build up some faith muscles and so that you can get blessings not only for yourself, 
But for those who need to hear from Jesus and to earn a profit for the kingdom of God, you are God's hands to go out there and show the world that Jesus really loves and really cares. But all we want is bless me. Oh, the AC ain't working. I ain't coming to church until you fix that. Don't ask me to give no money. The music ain't right now. I, I go to another church. That's, that's not faith in action. Now, we're almost done, but there's one other part of James chapter 2 that many people would skip because it talks about something that nobody really wants to hear about in church because right here in the Bible, the God's word is saying something nice about a prostitute. Nobody wants to hear about that in church. The Bible saying something nice about a prostitute. No, in church we point fingers, we condemn. You, I mean, especially the sin of prostitution. You can't get any worse than that. You don't talk about it in church in a positive light. But the Bible does, so you can't kick me out. So if you're sensitive, put your fingers in the ears. But the Bible does say something nice about a prostitute. I warned you. The Bible says in James chapter 2, verse 25, Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot? Harlot is an old-time word for prostitute. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? Now, you see, when the Bible writes it like this, it's assuming you've read the rest of the Bible. If you would go home and read Joshua chapter in the Old Testament, read Joshua chapter 2 and forward, it's a dazzling story. It's more interesting than them soap operas you're watching on TV. It is a wonderful story. But in the story, here's what's happening. God has told the Jews, go over and destroy, uh, what's the name of it again? Uh, Jericho, 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 yes. Jer Let me make sure. Joshua chapter 2, I think it's Jericho. Somebody find it for me. Joshua chapter 2. Uh, Joshua chapter 2, why am I, uh, yes, Jericho. So God told the Jews, I need you to go and defeat the nation, Jericho. Word gets to Jericho. He said, Jericho done heard what God did. He parted the Red Sea, how God through his power had caused the Jews to defeat so many nations. So now they heard the Jews are coming this way and they scared, <laughs> they terrified. But you know, any good army, before they attack, they're going to send some spies in to figure out where's the best places to attack. So Israel sent some spies, and the king of Jericho heard word. The Jews have sent spies to spy out the land. So the king has his men hunting them down. Rahab, the prostitute. You know what a prostitute does, right? I, if you don't know, go home and ask your mama, because I'll only go so far. But I'll say this much. I don't know how many hours a week you work, but this was the job she did to pay her bills. That means she was, prost what a prostitute does is sins. That's, their job is all about sins. And people are paying them to sin with them. And when people pay, they want what they want. So that prostitute was involved in all kinds of sins. Even to some sins people never heard of before because people paying her to do. That was her job. And when she wasn't doing it, you know, when you're not at work, you're home, washing your car, putting gas in it, cleaning your clothes to prepare to go back to work. So she was, when she wasn't actually sinning, she was at home preparing to sin. This is what she did. This is how she paid her bills. But despite the fact that she was a sinner, she had chosen the one and only true living God, Yahweh, the God of the Jews, as her God. She put her faith in that God, even though she was a sinner. Oh, I, I, oh, what a horrible woman. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The book of James says if you break even one sin, you're just as guilty as breaking them all. So don't be trying to put yourself, you might put yourself in a better category in church. But as far as heaven is concerned, a sinner is a sinner. So here's this professional sinner. You don't even want to know who she's been messing with. You, you don't want to know. But she made up her mind. I trust in God, my Savior. I almost feel like singing. I trust in God, my Savior. So, and, but, and so she said, them Jews, Jewish spies, 
They belong to Yahweh. I'm going to protect them. So she had them hide in her house. You understand what she's doing? If you're in America and you let spies from any other country hide in your house, you guilty of treason. The law says you for dead. Oh, sorry. I said that in Jamaica. The law says you can be executed. That is one of the quickest trials in any country. They catch you messing with spies, off with your head. It, it's been universal. Oh, no matter which country you go to, you mess with spies, you're dead. End of story. So she decided to hide the spies, which meant, even though she was a sinner, her faith was so real, she was willing to risk her life. Don't tell me this woman wasn't putting her faith into action. This is some serious good work. But you got to understand, if you read the story, they came into her house, her whole family was there. If they caught the spies in her house, they would execute everybody. As much as she was a sinner, her faith in God was strong enough that she was willing to risk her life, her entire family's life. On what God said. And oh, them soldiers came and they looked real good. Read the story. When you read the story, like, how didn't the soldiers find these guys? You know why? Because one of the women, apparently, when they decide to hide something, it's very hard to find it. Whether it's a secret or something else, they just know how to hide stuff from men. So all these men came in and they couldn't find. I guess because she was probably with her job, had her working with men so much, she knew how they think. So she knew exactly where to hide these spies. They couldn't find the spies. Israel came and defeated the nation. And her whole family was saved. And guess what? This woman has done more sins on an average Friday night than most of us do in a month, in a year. But as sinful as she was, we still reading about her. Thousands of years later, we still reading about her. We are profiting from her works of faith. What do we learn from this? We learn that even if your life has been messed up as a believer because you've done slipped and got into some really bad sin, don't let the devil tell you God won't use you. Even if you're a sinner and you still decide to put your faith to work, God is still going to notice. Yeah, don't get me wrong. Just because you're a sinner and you do good works, that's not an excuse to keep on sinning. Read the story of Rahab. Her life changed after this. God still expects you to be walking holy and righteous and true. But even if you're a sinner, guess what? All have sinned. Not some have sinned. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So if you're just like the rest of us or maybe doing it, doing the sin thing better than the rest of us, by the example of Rahab, if you make up your mind, even though you're a sinner and everything says don't do it because the church people or God want nothing to do with it, you put your faith into action and put it into work, God is still going to notice and God is still going to bless you. Putting your faith into action isn't contingent on how much the devil or other people tell you you're a sinner. It isn't contingent on how many people pointing fingers at you in public but want to pay you to do stuff behind the scenes. As she probably experienced. Some of them very public officials who condemned her in public is probably her biggest clients at night. God wants to know. God is saying, I already know you're a sinner. There ain't no news to me. What I want to know is, do you believe in me and are you going to put your faith into action? Because the more you put your faith into action, is the stronger your faith gets. The stronger your faith, get, your faith gets, it is the easier it is for you to say no to your sins. And it is the easier for you to do more faithful works, which leads you to more blessings. As sinful as this woman was, she found a way to bring profit to the kingdom of God. To bring profit to God's entire nation of God's chosen people. She brought profit to herself and her family. And the list goes on. Which means putting your faith in action can bring profit not just to you. Not just to the person you bless. Not just to your God. But also your whole family. Then the last verse says, verse 26, For as the body without the spirit is dead, 
So faith without works is dead also. As I said earlier, if I'm in this room and a terrorist has a gun at my head and on the ground is the most decorated police officer in history with every weapon, but the police officer is dead. Can the dead police officer save me from that terrorist? So I'm asking you, can dead faith save you? This is real water. If I really pour it on Deacon Chris, will you see evidence? Yes. But if I just throw him this, is there any evidence he's wet? Because the water is contained. How many people have their faith contained in their car just for Sunday morning? But it hasn't drenched their whole life so everybody can see the Jesus all over them. You got to understand in the scripture, when Jesus showed up, he made a difference. He showed up and people got healed. He showed up and the blind could see. He showed up and the crippled could walk. He showed up and lepers were, were cleansed. The list goes on. Even a storm couldn't stop him. Walked on water. Whenever Jesus showed up, a difference was made. If you really repented of your sins and accepted Jesus Christ for Lord as real and Jesus is in your heart. And if he's in your heart for real, there's going to be a difference. But if nobody can see any difference in your life. You got to ask yourself the question, are you saved? Is your faith alive or is it dead? Because even when I'm visiting patients in the hospital and they're next to death's door, if I look closely, I can see their chest moving because they're breathing. They're not doing much, but they are doing something. They might need somebody's help to, to stand on the walk and they're struggling. But if they were dead, they wouldn't be trying to get up, even though they need help. I don't know if it's a case where your faith needs some help. But I can tell you, if your faith is dead, there's somebody named Jesus who specializes in resurrection. You've got to ask yourself, is my faith alive or is it dead? If my faith is alive, where's the evidence? If my faith is alive... Where's the evidence? If we'll keep reading in James, you'll see where... Well, let me see. Uh, let's see. Where is it? In James chapter 2, there's a verse that says... Uh, you see, when you're looking too fast, you can't find it. Even, demon, even the demons believe in God, and they shudder. Do you even shake when you hear the name of Jesus? You're not even afraid of God? You so comfortable in your Christianity? Hasn't fazed you one bit? You're not even willing to do something about your faith? Is your faith dead? Or is it alive? Well, if your faith is dead or you've never given your life to Jesus, here's what the Bible says. How you can fix that problem. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 to 10, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with the heart that one believes unto righteousness, and it is with the mouth that confession is made unto salvation. I wonder if there's anybody here today who wants to give their life to this Jesus or who wants to re commit themselves to Christ. All heads bowed. Nobody looking around. There's anybody today who got some business they want to do with Jesus. Just raise your hand where you're sitting. Anybody? Anybody? I think I see two hands. They put them back down. Let's pray together. Dear Jesus, today we, your people, thank you for this lesson on faith. Lord, if you look on and check in your records and realize the angels have not reported any new good works in a long time, we ask that our God to wake us up, stir us from this comfortable Christianity and help us to get serious about putting our faith into action, being willing to demonstrate the love 
of Jesus. The best way is to tell them about faith in Jesus. So if there's anyone here today who's never given their life to Jesus, say these words after me. Dear Jesus, today I choose to repent of my sins. Dear Jesus, today I choose to believe you died on the cross to pay the price for my sins. Come into my heart as Lord and Savior and write my name in the book of life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Thank you so much.